I'm waiting. I'm waiting and watching the number climb. And when it tails off, we'll start. Gently start now. It's still climbing, but slightly slower. Uh, people who've just arrived, if you don't know what I'm talking about, at the bottom of your screen, there's something that says participants for us. Presumably it says participants for everyone. And we're watching. Oh, books in the background. Yeah. We're watching that number climb. Okay. Off we go. Welcome everyone to Tewkesbury, etc. <laughs> we're, we're all over the place. Um, thank you very much to the 30 Massachusetts libraries, including Tewkesbury Library, for sponsoring this event tonight slash this afternoon. Um, this, is, this is wonderful. We are gathered here. Well, the other people in this panel are gathered here because they are the five Agatha Debut Novel Award recipient, nominee recipients, there I did it, uh, for this year. And what that means is that they are the five people who wrote the best traditional mysteries. So the best mysteries in the tradition of Agatha Christie, which is why the award's called an Agatha Award. It's not the only tradition in the genre. You know, there's Raymond Chandler, there's John le Carre, there's Patricia Highsmith, fine all wonderful, but we honour and adore the tradition of Agatha Christie and write the books that we think maybe Dame Agatha would be writing were she still with us today, although she was getting quite dark by the end. So my name is Katrina McPherson. Um, I am a writer uh, and that's really all you need to know about me. I'm here tonight because it's my honour to be moderating this panel with these five lovely women and fairly splendid writers. So I'm going to do some introductions. And while I introduce the panellists in alphabetical order, uh, they're going to type their um, website addresses into the chat box. That's if you click on chat in the bottom, oh, we are all living on Zoom now, you know, right? While I'm talking about boxes though, what I would say is if you've got a question for the panellists, we're going to have Q&A at the end. Don't put it in the chat because it might get lost. Can you put it in Q&A and then I'll, I'll read them off once I'm finished asking my questions, which are mostly, um, you know, respectable, responsible moderator, moderator questions with some fun uh, quick fire round and a little bit of fangirl. Because why not? Who's going to stop me? So without further ado, here we go in alphabetical order. First up is Esme Addison who is the author of A Spell for Trouble. You see that there, not too much glare. Um, quick way to describe a, a Spell for Trouble. They're all murder mysteries. This is murder, magic, and mermaids. So Esme says that she discovered Nancy Drew as a child and has wanted to solve mysteries ever since. But as a mystery author, she's finally found a way to make that dream come true, a safe way. Uh, she's currently at work on the next book in the Enchanted Bay mystery series, Where a Spell for Trouble takes place. Is that still right, Esme? Yeah. Um, she lives in coastal North Carolina with her family. And when not writing, she, you can find her dancing her calories away in Zumba, patronising her local bookstores or visiting the beach, the mountains and all historic sites in between. Sounds lovely. So welcome, Esme, and congratulations on your nomination. Um, next is Tina de Bellegarde. Her book is Winter Witness. There it is. And I describe this as murder with very big personalities in quite a small town. Um, it was nominated for the Agatha, as all these books were. It was also nominated for a silver fal is it Falchian or Falchian? How do you say that word? I'm gonna say Falchian. There you go. Silver Falchian Award and a Chanticleer Mystery and Mayhem Award. Congratulations. Tina also writes short stories and flash fiction, which you can find on her website, so I believe. Uh, flash fiction, what's that? Fewer than a thousand words? Yeah. Oh. And often much fewer than that. Oh, okay. 
So tweet, like 280 characters, can you do it? Mm -hmm. huh. We do, 500, 100. I had an idea for later, I bet you can work out what it was. Um, her story, Tokyo Stranger, is in the current Mystery Writers of America anthology, When a Stranger Comes to Town, edited by Michael Carita. She's the secretary of her local chapter of Sisters in Crime. Thank you. She's also a member of Mystery Writers of America and Writers in Kyoto. She lives in Catskill, New York, with her husband, Denis, where they harvest shiitake mushrooms and tend to beehives. But she travels to Kyoto, Japan, regularly to visit her son, Alessandro. Oh. And next up is Kelly Koa. Her novel is Derailed. Her debut novel is Derailed. I feel like you've written four since, Mary. Um, she, Mary, is, uh, oh no, I'm going to say, what, what did I, how did I describe this? Um, a murder with a harassed single mom whose ex and ex-in-laws really aren't helping, I think, fair to say. Um, Mary was a Seamus finalist and Lefty and Anthony Award finalist, as well as Nagath finalist for Derailed. Uh, it is the first in the P.I. Kelly Pruitt mystery series. She's also working on an upcoming Misty Pines mystery series featuring a Portland homicide detective turned small town sheriff coming next September 2022. Her short stories have appeared in Women's World and in the anthology Peace, Love and Crime, crime fiction inspired by the music of the 60s. Just love these themed anthologies. She is the vice president of her local Sisters in Crime, thank you, and an active member of Mystery Writers of America, as well as Private Eye Writers of America. In addition, she, volunteer, oh, she volunteers her time as a Pitch Wars mentor. Ask someone asking the Q&A about Pitch Wars because everyone else is going to want to know. Uh, she lives in Washington, Washington State and Hawaii. Condolences, it's a hard life. Um, next up, Laura, oh, I can't do the alphabet. Next up, Erica Ruth Newbar. Sorry, Erica Ruth Newbar. No, I'm going to leave Erica to last for reasons that will become clear. Next up, Laura Jensen Walker, whose novel is Murder Most Sweet, which is murder with good books, good food and very good gal pals. Um, Laura is a former REF service member, a former... What have I just said? No, Laura is a former Air Force service member. <laughs> Laura is not a former RAF service member because that would be treason. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I have lived here for 11 years and you short, I still shorten Air Force to Her Majesty's Royal Air Force RAF. Sorry, Laura. Laura is a former okay. United States Air Force service member, former journalist, former Sacramento Capitol insider and award-winning author of 20 books. So kind of faking it as a debut author. Hmm. Uh, but these are fiction and non-fiction, not mystery, uh, including her memoir, the just fantastically titled Thanks for the Mammogram. Uh, Laura is a fiercely competitive trivia enthusiast and a confirmed Anglophile who lives in Northern California and dreams of England. Um, and are you typing in your, are people yes. typing in there? Yeah, you're okay. typing in your website. Thank you. Sorry, but sorry about that. Yeah. Um, the NSA is not listening. And finally, because I can't do the alphabet, Erica Ruth Neubauer. And this is her novel, Death at the Mina House, Mena House, Mina House. Mina. It's Mina. Mina. Death at the Mina House. Uh, murder at the Mina House. Or as I call it, Death on the Nile. And we are all so jealous. Any, it is set in Egypt. Uh, in the 20s and any author who says they are not jealous that Erica Ruth just went for it and said I'm doing this is lying because we just didn't know <laughs> that, you could, that you could do this it's great and um, Erica Ruth spent 11 years in the military United States <laughs> nearly two years as a Maryland police officer and one as a high school English teacher before finding her way as a writer She's been a reviewer of mysteries and crime fiction for publications such as Publishers Weekly and Mystery Scene Magazine for several years. And she's a member of Sisters in Crime and Mystery Writers of America. She lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And that's our panel. And welcome. Thank you very much. So, duly introduced. 
what I'm going to do is I've got some individual questions uh, for people that I'm going to say, can, can this person answer this question? And then everybody can pitch in afterwards if you'd like to. Um, and I want to start with you, Esme. I want to talk about the title of your book, A Spell for Trouble. This is slightly, <laughs> this is mostly moderating, but also, oh, it's so hard to think up titles. I mean, it's obviously a great ballpark title, but then quite late on, you realise that it's a, you know, it's a pin sharp specific title too. And I love that. Marion Keys does that. She, you know, there's a, there's a great title. And then late on in the book, you realise it's an extra great title. So can you talk a bit about coming up with a spell for trouble and titles generally? Sure. So um, with this series in particular, uh, I gave the publisher um, a list of different types, different titles, like a list. And they actually, um, and I thought this, I gave the, the manuscript that had a working title and they didn't go with that one. They picked one from the list <laughs> that was kind of, not not particularly associated with what I had written huh. <laughs> but I was in you know I was I was um not far I, I was not so far along that I couldn't tweak it to make it work so if I, I have and this has happened twice so every time I have found a really great way to make the title a an integral part of the story and so um I don't I don't want to give anything away but like the title is um I just I really once I get that title like it's really important to me that it makes sense so I just have to like figure out a way to make that work and make it really like an element of the suspense and the mystery. So just kind of, just kind of like work it out. So it's the it's the other way around. You didn't come up with a perfect specific title. You put you had a title and you put things in the book. That's yes. I'm gonna remember that. I'm not gonna write <laughs> it down because I'm busy at the moment, but I'm, I'm gonna remember that. How about other people? How what kind of was it easy? Did you have woes and trials and tribulations coming up with the titles for your books? Anyone jump in? Well, I, I kind of um, came up with that title sort of like spontaneously and I was my working title from the beginning. And um, I tend to work in this series with um, seasons and themes. So Winter Witness carries both, you know, will we'll carry both. And Witness, of course, is a word that we associate with crime fiction, but here it's kind of doing double duty. It's more like, um, it has more to do with the themes of the story. Um, so for me, it wasn't actually difficult because, you know, I had this particular purpose in mind for it. But um, I'm working on book three right now, and it doesn't have a title. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's a problem for me because I need, as Esme said, you know, it has to matter. The word, the title has to matter for me. So I'm working on that. Mm. My working title was actually Bamboozled. And it wasn't till I got an agent and got a little bit further along that we changed the title. But it fit completely because there is a, you know, a commuter train, um, a deadly commuter train inside the book. So, it, you know, it just worked. But I always try to, once I have the title, I try to um, work it in into the book somewhere so that it all relates back. So. It was a very different, I mean, bamboozled sounds jolly. And that was, derailed that's just, what, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that's that why what, it had to change. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little too happy for yeah. the murder. <laughs> And what, what's your second one called? The Denied. Denied. Yeah. You've started something. Now you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> book 11, you'll be thinking, <laughs> demented. <laughs> exactly. I honestly, mine was my working title and I thought they would come up with something better because I think it was kind of obvious. <laughs> I thought it was kind of obvious, but they stuck with it. And I was like, oh, all right. I guess that's what it's called. But I'm... It's perfect. Murder at the Mina House, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And Laura, yours, yours yeah. starts with murder as well. No, actually, I did, my working title was Strangled in Silk. Uh, and then after I um, hired an editor before I got the book deal, she says, you should do something food related because there's so much food in your book. And so that's when I started playing around and, and came up with Murder Most Sweet, which fits it perfectly. Yeah. It wasn't because there's a slight, whiff of um self like what do you call it sadomasochistic uh asphyxiation strangled in silk is a bit 50 shades ish oh no i didn't even just me 
I didn't you even did know. so <laughs> yes you did no it's not just me <laughs> but I'm glad that other if people aren't going what I get I get a kind of another resonance from strangled in silk I have to say okay. you know I wanted to say something about my title also that I'm trying I've noticed that um I'm using um the title not only just for the title of the book but in my books themselves there is a, a character who writes a, an article a column for the local gazette and her article or her column is entitled winter witness and in the second book that i just put out uh, just put into my editor it's the same story so i think i'm going to be sticking with that that the title will also be the title of the um that her column and it usually tackles the themes of the book so there's sort of, for my purposes anyway, there's a, yeah. an extra purpose. I wonder if it matters so much to readers as it does to us, because we're, it's like the four, three, four, five hardest words that you write are those words on the front of the cover. I want, it would be interesting if people say in the chat room or in the Q&A, you know, do you get something extra from a clever title or a title that in the book makes you go, ha ha, I don't know. Um. Uh, Tina, I want to move on to you next, actually, uh, to talk about another part of the process of coming up with Winter Witness, or rather coming up with Batavia, Batavia, Batavia? Batavia. Batavia. Batavia on Hudson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always yeah. want to say Sewer Hudson, Batavia, Sewer Hudson, but it's not. So it's part, this town is part kind of quirky, charming, someone's got a pet skunk, and part real and realistic and precarious so there's a subplot about um a drive on behalf of part of the town anyway to have a casino and to build condos and um, so can you talk a little bit about how you brought this town into being you know how how real is it where did it come from and also you know did you know that you were planning a setting for a series and you know how much did that play into your decisions it actually played in completely because I worked on Winter Witness with the intention of a series and I was looking for a small town to create a small town. And I know that that people find great, I don't know, they love being in a particular city that they love to spend time in and they'll write their books there. And I love my setting, but I didn't feel comfortable using these small villages around either my village where I live or my neighboring villages because they are so small and intimate and they're actually not that stable because they do kind of change with the times. They, they're very vulnerable to the economy. And I wanted a safe space in my book. I wanted my village to be um, quaint and charming and an escape for me as a writer and for my readers. And so I decided fictitious was the way to go so that I could make it a stable environment. And, um, and, and also I had the benefit of taking all my favorite parts of villages I visited and create my own and made a map, which I love. And, um, and so the setting was definitely planned to be for a series, and that's why it was important to me that it was stable. And also, I wanted it to be, I always wanted it to be an amateur sleuth, but I, and I wanted it to be somewhat lighthearted, charming, quaint, but I also wanted to tackle some serious topics. And I thought if I went with a small town and a, and a little bit of suspension of disbelief, from the reader, we could have an amateur sleuth and it could be fairly realistic. And so we could do have that balance of a little lighthearted, but also serious. Um, so that was my, my hmm. intention all along. Hmm, interesting. Mary, uh, sorry, I, I know I said, and then you can jump in when I'm picking on you, but it strikes me that the setting for a PI uh, novel, a PI series might be somewhat different from uh, what Tina did how can you talk a little bit about how you handled setting well for me you know i i grew up in portland and the impetus of the whole series was that um she worked and she was taking over her dad's pi agency so i really wanted a setting that she knew and that i knew and that had lots of gritty parts and that i could go visit these gritty parts and so um so that's why I chose Portland, of course, because it's I like I know it from the back of my hand because I, I grew up here, ran around those seat streets and worked at the law firm to look down on the um, bus route, uh, which is, you know, a part of the of the story. So 
Um, so is it all real? Did you change anything? Not, not as far as Portland. I stayed pretty oh, true okay. to, to the city. Now, in my second book, I do do a fictional town because I needed a little bit more creative license. But, but where Kelly Pruitt lives and works, it's Portland, and it, and I keep it pretty true to form. And have you had any letters about people disputing your no? <laughs> Haven't actually. I Not get, yet. A lot of people will tell me. Well, what's kind of funny is they will tell me, "Oh, I know exactly where that is." But okay, so I kind of lied a little bit. I do sometimes do create a create a little bit of creative license, and they'll be like, "Oh, I know right where that is," and I'll be like, "Really?" Because that was kind of a combination of things. But I just go, "Oh yeah, no, of course it was." <laughs> but yeah, people seem to enjoy it. They know where it's at. Who live mm. here? Anyone else? Erica Ruth, your setting is fairly lush. Can you Thank talk you. a little bit about, about that? Yeah. I mean, your uh, setting, setting in time and setting, uh, setting in place rather and in time uh, for you. So. Yeah. So I, my dad raised me on old black and white movies and Agatha Christie and Masterpiece Mystery. Um, and along the way, I picked up really romantic ideas about Egypt in the 20s. Um, so when I sat down to write a novel, I was like, well, of course I'm going to set it in Egypt in the 20s. Like, I had very specific ideas about, you know, a grand hotel and people very, belly, very elegantly dressed. And then there's like a body in the corner, but, you know, the slow fans overhead, that whole thing was very clear in my mind. Um, but I also wanted it to be a little bit of a locked room, kind of like um, a lot of the Agatha Christie mysteries have are. Um, so that's why I picked the Mina house, which is a real hotel. Um, and at the time in the 1920s, when the book is set, it was really isolated. It was really kind of out in the middle of nowhere and right next to the pyramids. Um, so it kind of gave me a chance to like make everybody, like everybody's kind of stuck here. Mm. Is it still there? Does it still yeah. exist? Oh, yeah. I stayed, I stayed there. Um, I did get to go to Egypt, um, and I stayed at the Mina house and a lot of it's been updated. I think it's owned by like the Marriott now, but, um, no. I know, but a lot of the old architecture you can still see and a lot of it's still there. It's really, it's a really cool hotel. So I think, I think Laura and Esme, you did more or less the same thing in making up, I think you both made up your settings, but do either one, one of you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, so my town is, is definitely fictional. It's the, the, the small charming town of my dreams. But it is located in an area, actually, I, I recently moved to the beach and I'm actually in the area that the, the town is based on. And so it's just kind of a general area um, between say like Jacksonville and Wilmington, North Carolina, which would be kind of like topsail area-ish. <laughs> so um, it, that's kind of the area. So it is based on a real area, but the town itself is definitely made up. And, and full of, businesses I mean that coffee shop just sounds fantastic that coffee shop is somewhere you want to be is there a Starbucks in your town this is what I want to ask no, no there's a city regulation against those types of businesses only in and your mom. fictitious town yes. yeah <laughs> isn't it nice to be God right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, as far as Lake Pottawatomie, Wisconsin, I was thinking of the hometown where I was raised, which is Racine, Wisconsin, which is a factory town, but it's renowned for Kringle, which is the most delectable Danish pastry ever. And I wanted to just make a small town just a few miles down the road so I could create whatever I wanted with its own bakery and its own thing. And that's why, and the Pottawatomie are the, which I learned, founded that area in Wisconsin. And I first heard it, my aunt told me about, I'm going to play, going to Potawatomi to play bingo. She would go to the Indian casino and play bingo. So that's where I first heard of Potawatomi, which is a wonderful name. And so I did the research and said, oh, they found, okay. And so I used, that's why I came up with that one. But yep, it's based on where I grew up, but a much smaller version. And it sounds like, it sounds like it's never going to be a slog to make up a town and put streets in it and put people in houses and put shops and businesses and yeah. I mean can you believe this is our job this is what this is work we can, we can say I'm working while we do that <laughs> but I mean so to get slight just slightly more serious for a minute Mary um in derailed Mitz who is your detective's daughter has a disability 
but and what I loved was the book isn't about that right the book isn't about the fact that Mitz um, is living with a disability because some people are disabled I mean just some people just are um, but can you talk a bit about your decision to uh, she's deaf um, Mitz can you talk about your decision to have a deaf child in the series and what I really wanted to ask was was there any pushback pre-publication because sometimes I think authors are bold and readers are bold and sometimes all the people in the middle and we love them and thank you but sometimes the people in between the authors and the readers are much more cautious and sometimes even timid so so was there pushback and and what's the reception been like I wanted to know yeah so there was no pushback I I was very happy about that um and I was inspired to have a deaf character because when I first wrote the book, which was um, back in 1999, I was with a critique group and my, one of my critique partners actually was a nurse for this Washington State um, School for the Deaf. So I had firsthand, you know, I had a great resource right there. And I've always been really intrigued with the deaf community. I could have signed and I can still sign the alphabet, you know, since I was seven years old. So I've always been really intrigued with the communication. Um, as far as why I put a character that was deaf in the um, book is that I really wanted Kelly um, to feel that she wanted to champion um, for her daughter and to show her that society can view you however they want to view you, but you don't have to define yourself that way. And so I think it really works well to have Kelly um, do that for her daughter, show her every day that she doesn't have to be defined by how society defines her. She doesn't have to acknowledge that as a disability. She can just have whatever she wants, so. I don't know if, if anyone else has got anything you want to, to pitch in here. I, I mean, I love that character and I also loved that it, it was another turn of the screw to make her dependent on people she'd much rather be independent of. So her ex and his mother but she needs extra help. She needs extra help. So she's in slightly even more of a, um, not pickle, but, you know, she's more, she's less able to say, oh, just stop. I'm going alone, which right. is, because, uh, you know, sometimes PIs, I'm not looking at anyone and it's no one here, but, you know, the troubled, divorced alcoholic doesn't speak to his kids, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we, we love them and there they are. But, it's lovely to see someone with real problems, real problems, like real problems that wouldn't be solved by just getting a grip. Right. Anyway, yeah, and the motherhood angle, just, angle, of course, too, right? Because I was yeah, going to say, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of the everyday problems that all women face is balancing career and motherhood and, you know, all of that. So I did want her to be real to that degree. So oh, do, does anyone else, I mean, we, so we were talking about Mitz in particular, but do, everyone, do you let your characters bubble up as they are, or do you engineer either to put in or take out um, what we would call you know, the identities of, well, age, everyone's got an age identity, but we don't know it for a while, do we? Uh, you know, class, race, sexuality, gender in your fictional community. What do you, what do you do? Or do you just let the cards fall, dice fall? I don't know what the expression is. Well, you know, I'll start. Um, I'm a I'm a plotter. I outline. I have a very serious character bible. And when I knew I was planning a series, I decided I needed to just um, fill this village with these characters that are going to carry through the series. So I came up with a certain number of them, and I fleshed out their background for myself and wasn't sure which ones I was going to use. But I do notice, and I know people, readers hear this a lot from authors. And until I was writing, I, I didn't experience it until I was really writing. Um, once I put them on the page though, they really did flesh themselves out. So even though I had an idea of who they were and what their motivations were and what their fears and insecurities were, it was the, the characters as they interact on the page that kind of really filled out who they were. And I've adjusted my character bible according to the experiences i'm writing um so i find that really interesting and i'm really an outliner i'm not a pantser i do not see what happens on the page as i write but there is a certain amount of that that happens and as well as entering the page 
So I'll find in, in, in a scene, if I need another character, one of them, somebody will be created on the spot. And I don't know how that happens either. It's all quite remarkable, but um, I mean, obviously we do it, but it sort of feels like it's more organic than that even. Oh yeah, absolutely. Someone, so Esme, are you going to say something? Before you say it, can you tell the people who are listening what plotter and pantser mean, just in case they don't know? Sure. Okay. So a plotter is a writer who plans everything out, um, the, you know, the, the beginning, the middle, the end, the setting, the characters, all the exciting incidents, the plot twists, like everything. And a pantser may just have the ending or an idea and they just like run with it. You know, there's there's varying degrees, I guess, of pantsing, <laughs> pantsing, pantsing, whatever. So flying by the seat of your pants, yes. right? Because I found out that pantsing does have another meaning, right? Doesn't it? <laughs> you must have gone to a good school, Esme. Doesn't it mean like to pull someone's pants down? Sure yes. does. Yeah. yeah, Erica Ruth knows. Yeah. Sense. Sorry, Esme, I just I just hijacked you. What were, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was like, oh, now I was trying to think what do, what word do I know for that? But I don't think I know one um, oh. for action. Anyway, um, so I'm a plotter and um, I, I know all of like, I plan out all of my characters. I know their age, their ethnicities, their their religion, their background, like, you know, everything. It, it just and sometimes a character won't be, I won't, they won't make it to the story. But like, I know like the people that, that populate this town, you know, like I know that there's, there's businesses that are there that are on the page, you know, things like that. So I, and I just kind of have it in my head. Um, and it's the same as what Tina says. And, you know, when writers talk, you know, either we're like geniuses or crazy, but we're like, you know, the writers, you know, they, they come to life and, you know, they make their own decisions. And sometimes they do things that we don't want them to do. Like all that happens. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's really, you know, it's very in interesting and exciting to, like, to create a character and just see what, ha what, what happens, like how they present themselves, you know, present themselves on the page. But, you know, they can, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, you know, like they, they, they can make a story go into a different, a, a different direction than you initially thought it would go and things like that. Even, and even yeah. though I'm the, the plotter, um, so, you know, there is, I, I'm not like, like totally rigid about it things will change because a character will want to do something that you know will want to do something different you mm. know um, or make a different decision or you know things like that so I once had a halfway through I think halfway through a book I had people sitting on a beach waiting for the tide to go out to get a dead body who'd been drowned like tied to a lobster pot full of rocks and then they splashed over the sands and turned the body over and it wasn't who I thought it was going to be. And I thought, oh, what? I'm going to be working late tonight. What's happened here? That was annoying. But yeah, yeah it worked out. <laughs> the, villain, the, the victim changed, but I, I have consistently had the, the, the villain change. Yes. I yeah, and did Go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say, that's the one thing that I don't plan. I don't know who did it. I know it's one of three. And I give them all compelling reasons to have done it. And then I let them kind of show, by the end of the book, I know who has done it. But it's never who I think. <laughs> never. Well, you can't, you, you know, the reader presumably can't guess the villain before you if you don't know, I would think, maybe. Yeah, that's the idea, I think. Mm hmm so Laura or Erica Ruth, do you have anything you want to say about populating your world? Uh, I'll, one thing I will say, when I wrote, when I came up with the idea for Murder Most Sweet, I, I had a definite character in mind. I wanted a woman who'd survived breast cancer and made the choice to go flat, had both her breasts removed and went flat. That was very, that, that was my you know, focus before I even came up with an idea for what the murder would be or any of that. I'd never seen a character like that on the page and I just wanted to see someone like me. And so that's where that whole idea for that book came was basically, I wanted to see this woman in a cozy mystery novel. And so from there, and for a while I just called it, I thought, I wonder if they'll call it the Breastless Baker series, <laughs> but they wouldn't. <laughs> 
funny that. For some reason, I don't know. <laughs> I know. No, but talk so. about, so talk about that, you know, I'd completely forgotten about that, but talk about the pushback then if you want, to, if you want to. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, early on, I went to a writer's conference and I took the first 20 pages of my manuscript and my agent had just started shopping it around and I took it and I showed it to a couple people and one person was like, oh, I don't know about breast cancer. And then I showed it to a male editor who was very lovely about the writing and said, oh yes, you definitely know how to write a cozy, but this breast thing is, it's just like there and the first page, the first line is just in your face. And he said, I'm just not sure that that'll work in cozy world. And I said, okay, he says, I hope so. But I just, I didn't, I've never seen that. And as it turned out, thankfully I got a contract and even got nominated for an Agatha. So it all worked out, but you know, there were people who thought, how can you do that? And there've been people, I've had some reviewers go, boy, do we have to keep, you know, I don't want to, I don't care that she had breast cancer and I don't want to hear about breast cancer and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, well, whatever. Oh, <laughs> you know? that makes me so angry that, cause I think my, my response, and you can't respond, but my response to that would be, Oh, well, good for you that you didn't mention it when you had two mastectomies, yeah. you know, exactly. you know, and if they have, and if they haven't, I'd say, well, the hypothetical congratulations to imaginary you then. Yeah. You can't, you can't say that. You can't say that to reviewers, right? <laughs> but you can think it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I was gonna say I'm a complete pantser. So I planned out my main characters. Oh, yeah, I'm a total pantser. I have no idea what's happening. Um, So I planned out my like three or four main characters. But then I would get to a certain point and be like, Oh, I need some more characters. So then I would sit, sit down and like figure out who some new people were. And that's how I went along for the first and the second book. You know, I'm surprised, but you shouldn't, that's the point. You shouldn't be able to tell once it's finished. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to tell how this book was born because, you know, once you've worked on it and worked on it, the, the, the structure is hidden, you know, the, the skeleton is clothed or the, the, the huge, horrible, stinking mess. I'm a pantser too, so I know <laughs> the huge, horrible, stinking mess is gone, sanitized and tidied, and it all looks as if you meant it. Yeah. yeah. But that is quite surprising. Huh. Hmm. I'm glad that you are too. Well, that's surprising as well. Huh. Yeah. Oh, and Laura is too. Yeah. And me, yeah. <laughs> so Laura, coming back to you. Um, so we're still talking about um, I'm still talking about characters. Mm -hmm. Teddy. St. James is your protagonist, mm. the breastless baker. Yeah. Um, and her mother, she's a great character. Her mother is such a fantastic character, but we kind of have to read their conversations like this. Um, so how, so I was really impressed with, how do you get the pitch of a sort of dysfunctional, well, sort of exasperating dysfunctional family relationship in what is a cosy mystery? I mean, it's not, grim so it's not it's not the dysfunction that you find in Angela's ashes or you know or something like that how did you have to dicker with that or did that come easily how did you how did you get that well um sometimes it was difficult because I thought I didn't want the mother to be so annoying she is annoying um I she you know she's upset that her daughter didn't have reconstructive surgery because she's thinking how will a man ever want you now and things like that and let's daughter know that so and I have heard that I used to speak around the country about breast cancer and I heard those that so so all these things I learned talking to women with cancer I would hear that and I thought I want a character who says those kind of terrible things um and you know you made her the mother, mother. <laughs> you didn't yeah. make her some mild acquaintance from the other end of the no, town. I made her, her mother. Yeah, I made her the mother. Well, in her age, her mother's very beautiful and very stylish, and Teddy's very bohemian and hippie like, and so they're very different. So I, I really wanted that conflict between them. Uh, in some of my earlier novels, I used to write chick lit, and I, a couple people told me after my first one, "You don't have enough conflict." So I, I always think I, I need conflict. I need conflict. So I really wanted the conflict between mother and daughter, but. You know, uh, she does, especially in the second book, Deadly Delights, mom comes around and you see a lot more to mom and you learn more. And then you their, their relationship gets closer and tighter because that does happen in real life with our parents, with our families. We have our issues and then some we learn more and we see more. And so I, I kind of want I wanted that, but I didn't want it to be so I didn't want it to be one note where the mother was just horrible all the time. 
but enough that you're like, what the heck? <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it was different. It was definitely a balancing act to do that. Hmm. That's interesting that you're saying you can't, because it's not like a sitcom. You don't, you know, there, there is progression in your characters. So it's not like you can't have them playing out the same scenario book after book. Right. But other people, and Mary, I might be looking at you. Um, have you got favorite awful characters? Your favorite terrible character, I might be looking at you as well, Esme, to write. And are you finding what, what Laura found that you that you begin to get more sympathetic to them? That's annoying, but I can see how it might happen. Well, definitely for for me, I have a couple. There's, you know, the ex-mother-in-law who lives next door and the ex-husband. Um, but yeah, you know, they start out a started out a certain way. But I, as I've written them and I've gotten deeper into their character and I see their motivation, and that's what I try to portray on the page, right, is that they're multi-dimensional characters. They aren't just one note, as Laura said. There's reasons why they are and, the, and that they're caring sometimes comes across as annoying and, you know, stifling and, and all of that. But that if, if once you find out the layers, they become... It, it, actually, Arlene is like my favorite character to right now, but in the beginning, she was the worst. But I, now I understand her and I love that about her. So, hmm. Hmm. Empathy, that'll, that'll Empathy. do for you, right? Yes. <laughs> it makes me think of um, Gregory Maguire's books, the like Wicked and, you know, we learn why the Wicked Witch, she wasn't born the Wicked Witch of the West, she turned into the Wicked Witch of the West, right? She has a history that explains it all you know mm. I mean Esme you you do have some just belting villains in a spell for trouble right and I get the impression that wasn't a chore to write it was it was a lot of fun to write those characters and um I kind of I don't want to like give away too much but I wrote there's one character that I had a lot of fun with and then I can't write her right now because she's not in the book, <laughs> but, but she had to go away. But um, by the end of the book, I was like, I love writing her. I, she needs to come back at some point. So hopefully she can, that, that character can come back. But it, it, is, it is fun to write them. And I'm thinking about like, I know their story and I do feel empathy for them. You know, I, you know every, and one thing you'll see through my series is that my characters are good and bad they make choices and you don't know if they're a good guy or a bad guy sometimes because I think it's more realistic that way you know um and you see them struggling with choices and you know more morality and in, in my in my series in particular there's magic you know there's magicals and there's mundanes and there's the whole ethical issue of should you you know do certain things just because you can you know, should you practice magic? Should you try to control people? Do that kind of, and just people that are on both sides of the of the coin. So it's 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 fun to 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 explore that and you know, like I said, be empathetic toward the bad characters as well, and and not just kind of you know make them like kind of one dimensional mm -hmm. one. -dimensional characters. Mm -hmm. Erica Ruth, then, when we're talking about characters, I loved the names of the characters. So back to back to names again. Um, it gets really difficult to, th to think up character names. I love the character names in Murder at the Mina House. I mean, Jane Wonderly, the heroine, everyone, is called Jane Wonderly, which is just fantastic because it's plausible. I mean, it's not cartoonish, but it's, um, you know, you can't help but have a reaction. And also Mr. Redvers. I was trying to work out why it, Mr. Redvers sounds so much like a romantic hero. Uh, but he absolutely, he absolutely does. Just the name absolutely does. Um, so it's never easy for me uh, to name characters. And you said that you stopped and, you know, had to think, oh, I need a person. So I'll stop uh, for a bit and make a person up. How easily did the names come? Not not super easily jane was easy. jane is a name i just really loved and wonderly i will freely admit that i stole from um the maltese falcon it is yeah um bridget O'Shaughnessy. one of the names that she uses is mrs is miss wonderly and so i kind of i snorked that because that my dad and i used to love that movie so um why not it's right there 
right? It's right there. Um, and Redvers was the name I found because I was going through old um, lists of like popular names of British of you know British babies and like whatever. And so I was going through and it just came along. It's pretty far down the list, but Redvers, I was like, oh, that's a great name. And then I decided to kind of use it like Cher or Madonna uses theirs, where it's just kind of that's it's just Redvers. Um, and I, I do not know why I decided to do that, but I, I enjoy the fact that I did. Um, but the rest of them, yeah, it is hard to come up with names. And I have been, I, you know, I've gone through graveyards, like walked through graveyards and kind of like picked, like take and pick it, but like, oh, I, I can use that later. I can use that later. I'm starting to steal my friend's names, either first <laughs> or last, just like, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow, borrow these, um, yeah, it, is, it's, it does get hard, especially because you have to populate each novel with so many people. Uh, so <laughs> any, anyway, if anyone else has got any hot tips about how to name characters, especially how to name Scottish characters, because it can't all be called mix something. It's just <laughs> dazzling on the page. You cannot have as many people called mix something or in Ireland, oh something with an apostrophe because it's just annoying to look at. <sighs> does anyone have a trap door to instant success for naming characters come on i will say like i feel and i feel like maybe other writers do this but like like erica was saying like i collect names like when i meet people i'm like i like that name like that name is going into my like my list you know someone's gonna be named that you know but, but I, I do a lot of like baby name websites you know i think about the person and like their character and then i find the name that matches that character you know, but, and I look, um, this is like a weird thing that I do. If I'm looking for a, a person from a particular culture or country, I go to their Miss USA <laughs> wiki page to see like what the women are named throughout the years. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back to the 50s or 40s. And cause I want like a name, whatever. And then I do it for like the soccer team. So I'm looking for a guy, <laughs> you know, if it's a different country or something. Yeah. And then and of course, like the social um, security list, like from the 1800s, like what, if you know if, he, if it's something like that, but that's what I do. That is good stuff. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I'll look up name origins and what's really nice about that is they'll give you the names, all the popular versions of that name in different um, nationalities. Mm -hmm. So you could take a common name and then give it a little spin that way too. Like I have Peter, P-I-E-T-R, T-E-R, um, you know, names like that, that are a little out of the ordinary, but not so out of the ordinary that people can't pronounce them or understand them. Although I have a few of those, but, um, but um, yeah, but I do the same thing. I have a list. I collect names. And when I'm named, when I have a new character, I go to that list. I have men and women and I, you know, I just go through till I find the combinations, first names, last names, whole little booklet. <laughs> People never mind, do they? If, if you meet someone, you know, at a signing or, or something and you go, oh, that's a great name. They're never going to go, don't you use my name. They're always quite pleased. In fact, we have got 114 people here tonight. Mm -hmm. Just, just you know, there are going to be names in this chat box tonight. And they might not be handy for 1930s Edinburgh, but, you know. Does anyone else have anything you want to say about names before we because I'm going to move seamlessly on. This seems like a planned segue. When I was um, thinking about moderating this panel, I had the correspondence saved in an email tab called Agatha Tewkesbury. And this woman, Agatha Tewkesbury, began to take form in my head through the weeks and months, I think, that we've been talking about um, having this event tonight. So for fun, I said to the uh, five panelists, let's, let's make up a character uh, and I think you've all picked a, an aspect of Agatha Tewkesbury to make up. And then, Tina, you said that, yes, yes, you can do a, a flash fiction in 280 characters on Twitter. So we've, we've fallen into that, right? <laughs> Let's do it. So Agatha Tewkesbury, in any order, anyone take... Anyone, and I wonder if it'll cohere. I wonder if, you know, that sort of nominative determinism. I wonder if the name Agatha Tewkesbury means that we're all thinking of the same person. Let's find out. Go. Anyone? Well, I will start with her with her job. She is a gossip columnist, and they tune in to Tewksbury's tantalizing tidbits to listen to Agatha spill the tea. Oh. 
clever. I have the because set. the Agatha Award is a, a teapot, right? Yeah. So I have settings. So she lives in the English countryside in a stone cottage. Mm. There's lots of beautiful flowers and the, the moors are behind her. <laughs> and um, there. <laughs> and I have, what does Agatha dress like? What is her, um, what does she wear? And I just picture her, I see her as tall and wearing flowing silken, vivid colored clothes, just sort of, you know, like turbans and, and you know, just things that swirl and twirl and just many vivid, wonderful um, twirling colors uh, in jewel tones, nothing boring, very bright, bold, and vivid. Well, she is hanging together perfectly so far, isn't she? What well, else have we know, got? I, might, I might be diverging a bit, so we'll see, because I had what she, uh, her favorite foods are, and I couldn't help but put Agatha Tewksbury in my head, reminded me so much of my Agatha Miller and my, my story as this really cantankerous, frank, you know, tell it as she sees it. And in order to be that person, she needs to have lots of black coffee and a prune Danish. Um, so no, I, I said black. black coffee and a prune Danish. I know, but. In a world without, with Cinnabons, she's having a prune Danish, okay. I had her deepest, darkest secret, and that was the um, the body buried in the, her lovely, lovely rose garden. Oh, there's a body in the garden. Of course there is, but the roses are yes. so beautiful. <laughs> right, it's so good for it's good for the roses. So she the sleuth or the the villain? The unreliable, unreliable narrator. You know, we don't know. Interesting. Huh. Well, she seems, she now seems like a real person to me. I will, I'm not asking anyone to do this. I'll do this. But I've never, <laughs> I've never done this. I've never written flash fiction. I've only written seven short stories in my entire life. Anyway, moving on from Agatha Tewkesbury um, in her rose garden with her flowing robes and her black coffee and her prune Danish and her deep, dark secret and her gossip column. Um we now move on to the public service portion of tonight's program, which is to ask all of you, in case there are beginning writers or emerging writers or aspiring writers here tonight, which there almost always are, what do you know now that you wish you'd known then, so before this debut novel, um, although it worked out all right for all of you, and is there anything that you would do differently? Anyone at all? I'll start. Um, I, I know now not to be so afraid. Uh, every time I start a book, I'm terrified because I think I can't do this. I've never done this before. What makes me think I could do this? I don't know if anybody else ever felt that way, <laughs> you know, these doubts, but I have finally realized I can do it. Oh my gosh. And you just put one foot in front of the other and show up and do it. And, you know, I think I, I would have started earlier um, and I, if I hadn't let my fears kind of hold me back. So it's like, you can be so frightened and so scared that it paralyzes you. And I've learned that just let that fear go and go for it and show up every day and it unfolds. And I'm delighted that it continues to unfold. So that's yeah. one thing I've learned. I can piggyback on that too, because I think that that's something we all agree on, that fear can really hold us back. And you said start earlier. And my fear of rejection or criticism kept me from also getting guidance and encouragement. And, and approval. So the earlier, the better. I waited to my 50s to produce writing for other eyes. And I think that was a mistake. And, um, and that daily routine. I think that people believe you need a special place to write. And I'm lucky, I have a cottage. My husband built me a cottage in the back just for my writing. It is a perfect place, but you don't need a perfect place. You need to write every day. And if you write every day and you have that habit of writing every day, you can write anywhere because your head is in your writing. It's when you don't that you need that special place, I think. I'm glad you said that fear, because Laura's talking about fear, and I was thinking, but fear of what? Because there's so many different things that we can be afraid of. So fear of fear of criticism, fear of rejection, fear of, yeah. Hmm. And I would kind of go a little bit on, don't get too caught up, I think. I used to get caught up on how I was supposed to do it. I, like kind of the plotting, the pantsing. 
I always thought I was doing it wrong because I was a pantser. Um, and so I try to plot and then it would lose all the fun and all my passion would just go right out the door because it suddenly was like I was doing something that wasn't true to me. So I think I would say, you know, to my younger self, just do it the way that works for you. And as long as you're having fun, you're doing it perfectly. Just keep mm. on. So that's what I would say. Mm. Well, I, well, I, sorry, Esme. Um, what I was going to say is the, and I still have to tell myself this, is to get out of my own way. Because just like everybody else, like I will get caught up in my own head and be like, I don't know what, this is garbage, what I'm putting on this page. Like, what are you, this is hot garbage. What are you doing? And you just have to get out of your own way and keep writing it so that once you get to the end, you get to go back and you get to fix, fix it. Um, and first drafts are usually for hot garbage. So you have to get out of your own way and get it down on the page. My husband calls it the big early wobble. The BEW, I'll come blatting out of my study going, I can't do this. I can't do this. And it's, this has never happened before. I have never known less about, there's no story. It's thin, it's flat. I don't know who these people are. I can't do this. And this has never happened before. And one time he made me write it down and sign it. I don't understand. <laughs> there's no story. I don't know what I'm doing. These characters are flat. The world's thin. There is no story here. And this has never happened before. And signed it. Then, of course, he lost it. But the next time, the next time I came blatting out of my study from the big early wobble, he was like, right, where's that piece of paper? Because this has happened before. This has happened 20 times before. Oi. Sorry, Esme. You uh, did I, start earlier. <laughs> I was, was going to say some advice that, that I would give to writers is to really spend time learning the craft you know, learn how to write a book, you know, actually learn, learn the craft of writing and spend the, the time you need to learn how to do it so that when you get to the point where you're looking for an agent, it's not a frustrating experience because you're, you're, not, you're not ready to get an agent yet, for example. You know, it's like spend time learning how to write, the plotting, theme, character, dialogue, the, you know, all of that. Like, make sure you understand how to do that first because then it'll make everything easier if you just, you know, you're not trying to, you, you know, you're querying and you're getting your feedback is like, oh, well, you need to, these characters aren't fully fleshed or things like that. So I would just spend, spend the time you need to like learn the craft and really, you know, writers groups, you know, take classes, read books on craft. And I'm still reading books on craft, like it never ends. You, know, you can always learn, read books with the idea, not just to, to enjoy them, but like dissect them, like learn from, like read like other readers. So I read other books, other writers, and like, you know, that inspire you and then like, you know, make you want to write better. Just, you know, have that mm -hmm. kind of mindset. I'm reading this, the last, right, just happens to be right here, The Last House on Needless Street. Has anyone else read that? It's, I picked it up because it's by another Katrina who spells her name like mine, Katrina Ward. That doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. But, oh, it's just on the edge of not being useful because it's so good. It's like, uh, why bother? But, you know, but, but yeah. And also that what you were saying as me is that there's going to be something in every class. There's going to be one thing in every book, even if it's just one sentence in every workshop or in every class, I think, I think. Yeah. Um, right. Quick fire round. Here we go. Um, who, any order, or maybe I should, uh, no, I, no, to, to make it quicker, I'm going to pick on people. Do you have, who is your drop everything and read the new one on publication day writer, Mary? Well, I'm going to, you know, I basically get whatever my friends are publishing that day. It hits my Kindle. It hits my mailbox. So I don't really have anybody in particular. It's like any of my friends, they are on automatic buy and it arrives Aww. today. Aww. So. This is a lovely world. There's not a great deal of backstabbing, is there? <laughs> um, Laura. The, oh, sorry, I had to unmute. That would be Louise Penny. Mm. Gotta always be Louise Penny. Although I haven't read her latest because I've been too busy writing, so I'm behind. But yes, mm. I adore, adore Louise Penny. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. She's lovely. She's a great writer. She's a lovely person. She's got fantastic hair. Hard to hate. <laughs> um Erica Ruth. Um, I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna give you two. Lori King and Sherry Thomas. Oh, lovely women. 
both lovely women. Laurie King, sort of right in your wheelhouse for historical fiction. Yep. Sherry Thomas, not at all. Oh, no, Sherry I'm thinking Thomas. of Sherry Harris. Yeah, no, Sherry Thomas no, writes. Sherry, the, Thomas. Sherry, Sherry Thomas writes the Lady Sherlock series. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was thinking of Sherry Harris. Yeah. Um, who's left? Tina. Um, I'm also going to cheat in a way because I'm going to say Ann Tyler because she's not a crime person, oh, no. but she's all character all the but time. It's just like a cuddle, isn't it? She's I wonderful. Mean, just like a hug. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely my favorite. Yeah. Is me? B.A. Paris. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just, just like that. Yeah. yeah so stick her. it. I love her stuff and okay. like, I'm reading it like immediately. Yeah. I can't can't wait. I know I've got my like tend to read things read the TBR shelf in alphabetical order, but there are some people that I can't I can't wait until they come round. They're just humming there in the pile. So sticking with Esme then, who is your fictional crush on the understanding that Jackson Brody is taken? A fictional crush. That's a hard one. Um, actually, oh, okay. okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's actually there's the I have a, a friend writer, um, Julianne Lindsay, who also wrote writes as Julie Chase. She has a a series, um, the Seaside Cafe, I think, and it's the like the the law enforcement guy. <laughs> oh, like the sexy cop that's in there. He's there's nothing wrong with the sexy cop. Yeah, Laura. Um. Armand Gamache, Louise Penny, oh. Armand Gamache. I just He's love so him. married. He, I know, but I can still be, have a, and so am I, but I can still oh, yeah. have a crush. He's wonderful. <laughs> He's like the perfect man. He's the perfect man. He is lovely, yeah. isn't he? What do you think about the person that's going to be playing him on the telly? I think Alfred Molina will be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who I've completely lost track of who's answered and who hasn't, so we'll just go for it now. Eric Ruth. Uh, I'm going to go Lord Ingram from the, the Lady Sherlock series. Oh, okay. There's themes de- themes developing. There's themes, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Tina and Mary, have you? I'm going to say no. Marlboro I like I like my Marlboro man. Hmm. Marlboro man, like the actual Marlboro man. Longmire. Oh right, oh, sorry. Marlboro. I thought you meant the actual billboard guy. No, well, yeah. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> I think have a breath. <laughs> I do like like Longmire myself, but I have a thing for Ranger, uh, the Janet Ivanovich, uh, Stephanie Plum novels. Oh, yeah, it's called Dark and Handsome. Yes. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay, sticking with Mary, because then uh, if you were attacked, I'm not seeing if you were murdered. If you were attacked and you're in a temporary coma, what fictional detective would you want on the case? I like J.A. Jance's J.P. Beaumont. Uh Uh-huh. He would be be good. So I'd I'd go with him. Tina? I'm going to say Columbo. I know he's not a book, but not a book fictional character, but he always gets his man, so. Oh, yeah. I'd like to meet him, actually. He's so much fun. Yeah. 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 Bowl of chili with Columbo. That's That's right. Yeah. Erica Ruth. Nero Wolf. Mm. Oh. I love Nero Wolf. Yeah. You'd want them on the case. It'd be a shame to be in a coma the whole time. Yeah, I know. Because I'd love to meet Archie. You know what? I'm gonna also, <laughs> as an addendum, I have a trash on Archie from the Nero Wolf books. So, yeah. Poirot, someone saying in the chat box. Good mm-hmm. call. Laura. Um, Gamash, of course. But okay. that's kind of tied with uh, Sue Graff. Oh, no, I did and- ask. Sorry, I've already asked you. Yeah. No, you don't ask me about. Oh no, this is like moment. you want your boyfriend to, to right. solve your. It's the same, yeah, it's the oh, same right, one. Okay. But I also okay. think I'd love also Kinsey Milhone. So it's a toss up between oh, Kinsey yeah. and Gamash. This, yeah. this is turning into one of those like dream dinner party questions. Yes. <laughs> Esme, how about you? I'd say Jessica Fletcher. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yeah. Because you wouldn't die, because it's never that bad, right? Nice, nice, a nice woman like you would not die in that story if it was Jessica Fletcher. Good one. Um, writing snack. Do you have a writing snack of choice to keep you going? Now, you can go aspirational, because I can pretend I eat sunflower seeds and actually I eat peanut butter out of the jar with a spoon, or sometimes a pickle. 
So, uh, like, do you have a writing snack that keeps you going? Can it be a beverage? Yes. Coffee. Oh, yeah. Laura. I'm going to put two things together. Of course, a cup of tea, either Yorkshire Gold or PG Tips and hobnobs dunked in. Oh, Got to yeah. dunk my hobnob in my tea. So does everyone else know hobnobs? You can probably get them on Amazon. They're yeah. you really... Can, um, or Cost Plus has them. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, Erica Ruth. Um, cheese and crackers. I'm from Wisconsin. So like I will eat cheese and crackers at any time of the day for any meal. Yeah. Tina? Coffee, coffee, coffee. And if I need a sweet, a gummy bear. Oh, several gummy bears. I'm, I'm lying if I ever say eat one, but yeah. That sounds very abstemious, I've got to say. Coffee and gu a gummy bear, yeah. Gummy, a gummy bear is not a unit of gummy bears. Mary, how about you? Just, you know, I'm a coffee drinker and I don't usually snack too much, but if M&Ms are nearby, they're mm. mine. So. Mm. <laughs> so this is the last last quick fire round question. So if people have got questions that you want to put in the Q&A, now's your chance to get type in while I ask this last question, uh, which has got absolutely nothing to do with writing, but it's a, it shines light on our, our palace. If you can't have a cat and you can't have a dog, what pet would you have? Mary? A big floppy-eared bunny rabbit. Good choice. Yeah, you can't have a cat. Yeah, yeah, good choice. Tina. Mm. Canary. Canary oh, every two, so they sing, male and female. Oh yeah, that would be great. Have to have a like a big, you know, back in the back in when you were writing about Erica Ruth, you could have a little cage with a little bird in it because we didn't know any better. We couldn't really do that now. No. Um, and you know, you worry about like your house, but oh yeah. So Erica Ruth, how about you? Hedgehog. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> we found a litter of baby hedgehogs once and they were so, and the mother, but they were right beside a busy road. So we took them, we took them to make them safe. And the mother just went into a ball, but the babies were too small to be scared. So they were sitting, you know, with two little paws in my hand like that, just looking around going, what's this? It was fantastic. But then we had to let them go. Laura. Um, mine would be a stuffed dog because I thought about this for a long time and I thought I hate rodents. So hamsters or guinea pig or any of that, they creep me out. Birds terrify me because of the Alfred Hitchcock film, the birds, they fly around it and it's like, ooh, and no reptiles. So what else could I have? So I said a stuffed dog, that's mine. Okay, moving along swiftly. <laughs> Esme, how about you? I'm gonna also go with the bunny rabbit. So I'll keep fuzzy bunny rabbit. Yeah. yeah. I think it would have to be for me if I can't have a cat, a rabbit would be the next best thing. So I, I am, I am going to ask one more question if I get a chance. But let's go to the. Oh yes, here we go. Carol Puglio in the Q and A is saying, "Mary, please tell us about Pitch Wars." Thank you, Carol. So Pitch Wars is a mentoring program. Um, each year they take um, applicants. Uh, there, this year there was over four thousand. And there will be approximately 130 um, mentees. And during that process, we will be mentoring um, writers on their novel and getting them ready to submit to agents and have an agent round where agents will come in and take a look at a little bit of what they've written. And hopefully they'll get an agent out of the whole deal. And it's not a funnel that ends up with one person every 10 years moving into a career in writing. It's very... Um, I can't think of the word, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of success comes out it's, of Pitch Wars, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a and, lot of hard work on your, uh, yeah. And a lot of community. I mean, I mean, if you don't even get the agent, you know, learning to edit your novel and working with community and being edited and working with somebody along those lines. I mean, there's so much you can gain from Pitch Wars. It's, it's not the end game is, you know, for a lot of people is to get the agent, but you, there's so much to it along the way. It's a wonderful program. And what's the first step? Just Google Pitch Wars or what's the first? How do you find it? If people yeah, are interested. Pitch, pitch, Pitchwars.org, I believe, is the website. Um, and that has all of the information you need on about when they take submissions and the, the window and, you know, all of that. Right now it's over. They'll be announcing mentees 
um, on Friday night or Saturday morning at 12.01 a.m. <laughs> and then uh, we'll be working with our mentees all the way through February. And then they'll start the process again next August. So, Thank you. It's just it's a wonderful program. Um, here's another very specific one that we can mop up. Tina, please define character Bible. Oh, yes. I mentioned it earlier and I promised Bella I would talk about it. Um, in my character Bible, at least, it has names that I try on for my my uh, characters, hopefully settle on one. It has dis physical descriptions. I very important so we don't describe somebody's eyes one color at the beginning of the book and another color at the end of the book. Um, you know, so all the physical descriptions, their backstory, um, their aspirations, who they're married to, where they live, perhaps anything that is identifiable that could be uh, a continuity issue in the book or the series later on. So I can always refer back to that character Bible and make sure, you know, now I'm starting on book three that I have my, my people straight. Even though you think you have them completely straight in your head, sometimes, you know, when you're writing, you could get some of the details lost, you know? So it's a, it's a reference for yourself, for yourself. Am I missing anything, ladies? That sounds about, that sounds like the sort of thing I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two linked questions here. Elaine Pugliese, I, I hope that's how you say your name, Elaine, um, wants to ask how much input do you have with the jacket illustration? And then sort of similar, someone said, Nancy Rice is asking, uh, is saying that she read once the authors don't pick their titles, but book editors or publishers do, which is what happened with you, Esme. Um, has anyone given your book a title you don't like? And I'll expand that a little bit. Like, do you know what you would do if that happened? So input with illustration and input to titles, if anyone wants to take that. If no one wants to touch that with a hole. I'm just say, I've, had a ton of, I've had a ton of great luck because my publisher allows me to pick my own title, hasn't questioned my titles. And I have uh, chosen my own artist actually for my cover art. Um, oh. so I got really lucky there, but um, not everybody cool. has that experience. So, and I'll, yeah. Um, so with my books, uh, my publisher was Crooked Lane and they asked early on, they said, tell us about your book book tell us about you know what the town looks like and you know certain features what the person looks like all that and then they did a mock-up and showed it and when they first sent me from Murder Most Sweet just a black and white mock-up I loved it but the dog was way too big they, they had made the dog look like a husky instead of an American Eskimo which is a much more delicate dog so we turned that you know had to change that down but and then they showed me the colors and I just said oh it's fabulous I love it and but yeah, so they they do show they they give you an idea and you get to you get to say yay or nay. I mean, I've never said no, so mm. uh, you know, I don't know what would happen if you did. Yeah, yeah. See, isn't that fun? That sounds like a good it's experience if you got to if you got to negotiate dog delicacy. Yes, <laughs> I've got a picture on one of mine with a Dalmatian with the tail of a retriever, and you know, but I didn't get to do anything about it. Does anyone else have anything you want to say about that? My my thing would be, if no one else is going to jump in, unless you can't imagine anything worse, say, oh, I love it. Yeah. Because if they change it, you know, it might be it might be even worse afterwards. Um, but I was promised I wasn't going to be like this battle scarred old, you know, Moby Dick with like arrows hanging out of me um, with you fresh young <laughs> young authors this will never happen that doesn't happen anymore just ignore me um right more here's a lovely question how did you celebrate finding out that you were nominated for an agatha can you remember was it january kind of time january february i think I, I think my two aunts that live down the street from me they're my dad's sisters they brought over a bottle of champagne two aunts yeah, they're really great. Um, my husband, uh, my favorite, he makes the best. He's a great cook. And so I love a good steak. He went out and got the most expensive cut and made me a wonderful steak dinner. So, mm. yeah. We did champagne too at home, just the two of us. Oh, yeah, because it was, you couldn't fling a party when you found out that you were nominated right. for the We did it all, all from launch to now pretty much has been under covid 
Yeah. Yeah. Sushi is usually involved in our celebrations. And uh, so we always get a platter of sushi. That's kind of our thing. And, um, and then we don't drink, but you know, we always have a sparkling cider close by. So we always toast on all the Yeah, days. I don't drink either, Mary. Sparkling cider in a nice enough glass. That'll yeah. do, as long as it's a nice glass. Yeah, yes. it's me. Um, I went to my mom and dad's house and sat down at their in their kitchen, had coffee, and told them they love hearing about my my writerly exploits. You know, I think probably oh. all of us are writers as children, or you know, you're always like the writer in the family, and it's yeah. nice for them to to see like where it's going. So that's probably my biggest thrill is always like just calling them and saying, "Guess what?" You know, and they're like, "What's happening now?" <laughs> nice. It's lovely when when Malice Domestic, who who administer the Agatha Awards, uh, reveal who the nominees are. They don't just email; they phone, and that poor woman phones and must be deaf, like with tinnitus, at least by the end of the day, from <laughs> screaming down the phone. But it is, it's lovely. Um, ah, here we go from Alexis Christopher. Not a question, but a suggestion. At Malice, there is a live auction, and some authors enter a name in their next book. Could be a victim, a suspect, or just a walk-on character. Have you done that? Would you do it? Who would that character be? I'd do it. Sure. Yeah. Then you've got then you've got the name. You've got to get that name in. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't make him the victim. That'd be weird. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a character in like in the coffee shop. <laughs> Erica Ruth, you might be in trouble. I never used to do it because I couldn't have some like Keanu or Kylie in mm -hmm. 1930s Scotland. So yeah, you might be in trouble. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, if it was a name that that was period appropriate, I could do it. Yeah. Maybe you could use just their last name, like Mrs. Whatever. Right. Oh, that's a good point. Nice. Oh, but we will we will get back and we will be do, we will be doing that. Here, here we go. There's two sort of similar questions. One from Bella Spizer. I hope I'm saying your name right, Bella. And one from an anonymous attendee. Um, so how do you budget your time between writing, reading, research and life? And Bella asked um, when and where do you do your writing and what's a typical day of writing? So those are kind of similar um, questions. How do you? I'm interested to know that. Do you do, have you got a word count? Have you got a time slot? Have you, how do you do it? I can ask. Go, oh, go, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, I'm a kind of a creature of habits. So I spend two to four hours every morning during the weekday. Um, and that is my dedicated writing time. And um, I will say, I'm trying to get better at balancing life. You know, I need to get that workout in and, you know, go to the grocery store, do, do these other life things. Cause when I'm in the middle of a book, that's all I want to do is write. Um, but I always do the two to two to four hours during the week. And then I try to stay away from all writing on Sunday so that I, you know, so I stay happily married. It's like, it's what I like to say. <laughs> okay. Um, as for me, I, because when I started, my degree is in journalism, so I have a writing background. And when I started writing books, I just thought it's it's my job. I need to show up every day. And so I put in eight hour days. I start, I used to start at, uh, when I full time job, I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning and start so I could write before work. Um, now I'm retired and I can, I walk with my husband in the morning first. So now it's about eight o'clock. I start, I used to like starting at seven, but it's good to get that walk in. And I write for eight hours. I take a lunch break. Um, when I'm on deadline, I've been known to do 10 or 11 hour days, but I try to also try to take Sundays off. So this, I love the idea that you're mm -hmm. lolling about till gone eight. <laughs> like, this is not, this crowd is not the Hemingway <laughs> crowd. <right? laughs> There's no F. Scott Fitzgerald nonsense around here, unless I'm just about to hear something different. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a morning person too. So I start in the morning. I'd like to say I have a routine that I do the same thing every day, but I, it's more like I do the same thing for a week or two. And then I change up my routine because that question of balancing reading, writing life, there is no balance. So it's basically, I can do two or three of them, but then of course, one of them was dangling out there. So then when I give that attention, then something else has to fall off by the wayside. And there's, I have not found the balance. Mm -hmm. But do you read because you said, sorry, I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to, I am stepping in, but I don't mean to, but you know how some people say I don't read when I'm writing? 
And I think I yeah. wouldn't be a writer if I had to stop reading to be a writer. Anyway, so, sorry, back to the question uh, from Bella and the anonymous attendee. I'm with you, Katrina. I wouldn't be a writer if I couldn't keep reading. There's no way. Um, but I also am not balancing all those things. Like, heavens, no. Um, I'm not a morning person, but I write in the mornings. So I get up, I get up and make a lot of coffee. And then that's the, then that's the first thing I do is I sit down and write. And sometimes I actually have a coffee shop that I really like going to. It has a nice high bar, like a with like tall stools that I can sit at and like kind of watch all the people on the street. And I'll sit there for like two or three hours and get my my I usually set myself up like a goal for a word count. And then I have to sit there until I make it and then I can go home. That's what I like to do. I don't know if we've mopped everyone up or if Esme, you still haven't answered yet, right? Yeah, I was just like, the question was exhausting, just listening to the <laughs> question. <laughs> um, the only thing that's really consistent for me is that I try to do like eight hours on the weekend, like eight hours on Saturday, eight hours on Sunday. And then during the week, I have a bunch of other things going on, plus, plus kids, you know, and they're all in remote school right now, virtual school. They're over mm. So I, I try to write where, where I can. Like Saturday and Sunday is really like my time. Like I'm working, don't talk to me. <laughs> but. Well, I think kudos, <laughs> double points for remote learning with your kids and working eight hours Saturday and Sunday. And I see that Robert is back. Uh, we're slightly over time. Robert, do I need to wrap up or can I do one last question? Or do you um, think we should wrap? One last question is fine. One last question, lightning quick. Uh, in accordance with federal, state, county and city laws, this has got to be the last question of the panel. What's next, everyone? I'll Tina. Start. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> I just handed in my manuscript for Dead Man's Leap. That's book number two in the Batavian Hudson series. And here is my cover. So this is a reveal. Oh. No one else has seen it yet. Um, oh, beautiful. It's a card. Um, mm. So I'm very excited about that. And I'm um, starting book three. And that'll be a challenge for me because Bianca, my protagonist, is going to be going to Kyoto, Japan in that book. So it'll be um, it'll be new for me. So that'll be great. And oh, and I'm doing NaNoWriMo right now, National Novel, novel writing. writing Month, right? And me I'm working too. on a standalone project uh, right now because it's been in my head all year and um, I wouldn't dare look at it because I was finishing up book two. Um, so I'm going to give it a few weeks and see if it has legs. So I'm kind of excited about that. Mm. Erica Ruth, how about you? You bet. So it's book two, Murder at Wedgefield Manor, came out in March. And book three, Danger on the Atlantic, comes out March 2022. Oh. Um, cruise ship. Cruise ship. Yeah. The cover is beautiful. I wish I had it right here, but the cover is beautiful. Um, and I am currently working. I have a, I'm, have a rough draft of book four. So, wow. Esme, how about you? I'm uh, working on the third book in the series and also uh, a new series, first book in a new series. Ooh. Mary? Yeah, so Denied, which was book two, came out in May, and the third book, Deceived, in the Kelly Pruitt series will be out in May of 2022. And then I do have a new series starting in September, uh, Hidden Pieces, which will be that Portland homicide detective turned small town sheriff. And I'm currently working on the second draft uh, for the book in that series. Mm. Two launches next year. In person, please God. Yes. Laura. Uh, oh. Laura. My heart, it's a historical. It's oh, you need to story. start again because you froze there. Start, start again. Okay. I'm deep in which is a world war ii novel set in england i've wanted to write for 40 years i'm now halfway through it i've also finished my memoir and i'm hoping i will have two books out in 2020 memoir, which is the book of my soul and or two novel, which is the book of my heart so mm. here's things fingers crossed you were crackly, but we got Book of My Soul and Book of My Heart, and I can't think of a better way to um, end this panel. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much, and thanks for the questions, people who were in that question and answer box. Thanks, Robert.
Yeah, thank, thank you, you Katrina. Much, thank you all so much for joining us. Look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please take 60 seconds and fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. And I'll also include a link to the recording. Uh, please uh, share it with anyone in your life who you think may be interested in tonight's event. Uh, folks, make sure to look at the chat uh, before you leave. They're all thanking you for a wonderful evening. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night or their afternoon. Thank you so much, Katrina. Thanks, Robert. Happy writing, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.